Are we going to hell or moving out from there? This week, Soul Fire Farms' Leah Penniman talks with Chris Hedges, author of America, The Farewell Tour, about environmental threats, societal breakdown, and how we might come back together as humans. Then, A Glimpse of Caged, a play written and conceived by Hedges' writing students in a high-security prison in New Jersey. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. is a familiar checklist for extinction, and we are ticking off every item on it," wrote one of our guests last year. The latest climate assessments warning of food shortages and mass die-offs seem to be recent ticks on that checklist. But the problems that plague us aren't only physical and economic and political, they seem to be spiritual. Resistance, that same author writes, is about becoming a complete human being. So how do we do that? With a new year upon us, a traditional time for beginning and connecting, I'm happy to have two people with me today who can help. Chris Hedges is the author I just quoted. His most recent book is America, The Farewell Tour. He's also a weekly columnist for Truthdig and hosts the Emmy award-winning RT series On Contact. Leah Penniman is the co-director of Soulfire Farm, about which we have reported on this program, and the author of the new Farming Wild Black, Soul Fire Farms' practical guide to liberation on the land. Leah, Chris, thanks for coming in, and thanks for coming together. You know, I, I, I brought the two of you together because I'd interviewed each of you separately recently, and I just thought, gosh, I wish the two of you could just talk. Um, but let's start with you, Chris, because let's start with what we're up against, and then let's talk about this work of connection that I think both of you actually know a lot about. Um, those climate assessments. Uh, the fourth one came in right after Thanksgiving when most people paying no attention. I think the Trump administration released it at like 2 a.m. or something. It was pretty dire. What did it predict? Well, they're all, I mean, the last four or five have been very dire, um, including the UN report and others. And the, the common theme of all of them is that the ecosystem is deteriorating at a rate that is far accelerated from what climate scientists had thought in the past. And of course what they fear are feedback loops. And we know what feedback loops do because uh, we've studied Venus, which used to have water and is now 800 degrees. And in essence, you know, for instance, you lose the polar ice caps. Um, this exacerbates uh, uh, the rise in sea, the acidification. I mean, they feed off of each other and you lose control. And climate scientists have run studies um, which uh, range from a 70% die-off of the human species to complete extinction. So, and the fact that we're not responding rationally. Um, and I think a lot of it, and you can speak to this, is we are physically dislocated from the environment. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons I spend every summer and have uh, in the White Mountains with my kids because I, I want them to understand the power and, um, you know, even the sanctity of the natural world. And, I, and uh, so that what's happening and the deterioration, this form of ecocide is not palpable for people who live in urban areas and survive off the corporate system of food distribution, chuck, trucking, tomatoes, you know, mm -hmm. all the way from California. And yet your book, it does talk about the ecological threat. It also talks about the threat of war. Right. It talks about the threat of addiction. Um, you do make a case that this isn't just an, ex these aren't just external factors. There's something else going on. Right, they're created by the rupturing of social bonds. What Durkheim, the sociologist, calls that enemy, that alienation, um, that, uh, inability in the corporate state to self-actualize, to find a place to have dignity and meaning in your life. 
Um, and of course, the whole cult of the self, which lies at the core of commercial society or consumer society, is a recipe for anxiety and self-destruction because the attainment of a particular product or an experience for money um, is just the starting point for further desires, which they know very well. Um, so again, I mean, it's part of the reason I shut myself off. I'm not on any social media. I try to build as many walls as I can. You've probably built them more successfully b because um, I, I find the, the common culture or the vernacular of the culture, especially as it is disseminated now through handheld devices, to be um, you know, very detrimental to our emotional and our spiritual mm. health. Your farm is called Soul Fire Farm. Soul is the first word. Talk about how you intersect with what you're just hearing. Mm, the cult of the self. It makes me think about uh, some of my first farming teachers were women in Ghana back when I was 19, 20 years old. I lived for several months. And they pulled me aside one day and said, Manye Amidede, which is my name there, is it really true that in the United States people plant a seed and they do not pray, they do not sing, they do not pour any libation, make any offering, or even say thank you, and they expect a harvest? And ashamed, I had to admit that that was the pervasive practice, of course, here in the United States. And they said to me, no wonder you're sick. <laughs> right? Um, and I think that speaks to what you're talking about, that when we treat the earth only as a material thing and our interactions with her and with one another as transactional, it diminishes our souls. So Soul Fire Farm was created certainly, you know, with the mission to end racism and injustice in the food system. And part of that is about policy and resources and land redistribution. But another part of that is about healing from trauma and decolonizing ourselves, re-indigenizing our relationships with one another and with the natural world. So these are two very different directions of the narrative. I mean, talk about Ghana, it's like the obliteration of a people through slavery and the healing from that casts a very different light on history. It's like it's moving from obliteration, perhaps somewhere better, than the version that I'm hearing from you, Chris, which is we have self-destructed. So is this a racial difference? Is it a gender difference? Is it just a choice to how well, you look no. at Well, no, I mean, the, we have self-destructed, and um, all you have to do is look at what Malcolm X called our internal colonies, these deindustrialized zones that have been turned into quasi police states where lethal force is delivered indiscriminately to unarmed um, people, mostly people of color. Um, I teach in a prison, the whole system of mass incarceration is. I think I would argue the most important civil rights issue of our time. Um, it is a form of social control. Um, 2.3 million, we have 25% of the world's prison population. So w what we've done is taken uh, a segment of the population, and in particular people, people of color, uh, left them on the streets where uh, they're forced largely into an illegal economy, so that we're in essence criminalizing poverty and then funneling them into a prison system. And I think really it comes down to that commodification of everything, the natural world and human life. Um, and so these black and brown bodies cannot generate an income for corporate power on the streets of our cities, but if you put them in a cage, they generate 50 or $60,000 a year, and, and, and having spent now over a decade teaching in the prison system, people say the system doesn't work. And I say, no, no, the system yeah. works just the way it was designed to work. Many days I wake up thinking, oh, we're going from bad to worse. Then there are the days that I come to do this program, which is all about finding models of change and lifting up models of change, where I come away at the end of the day thinking, well, maybe we're going from bad to a little bit better. Maybe there are, crumbs that we can follow to take us on a different path. And you're one of those crumbs, so speak up. <laughs> Hopefully we're more than crumbs, right? <laughs> well, I don't know about the arc, you know, of bad to worse or good to bad. And I certainly don't think our people were ever obliterated. I mean, we, we've been up against a lot. Slave, the transatlantic slave trade was no joke. Um, 
enslavement, bondage slavery was no joke. And, and the whole criminal injustice system and mass incarceration is very linked in with the food system. You know, in, yeah, in 1865 is, with the Emancipation Proclamation, there's the loophole. You can still be enslaved if convicted of a crime. So the prisons fill in 1866 with black people, not because folks were raping and pillaging, but because new laws were on the books called the Black Codes, vagrancy, loitering, truancy, being not upright and honest. That gets you in jail, and then you're leased back to the plantation. You're leased back to the mines. You know, Alabama had 73% of its state budget coming from convict leasing in the late 1860s. And, and that black youth in our community are still picked up for those same non-crimes, hanging around, not having a job. No, my favorite is yeah. obstructing, I'm not making this up, obstructing pedestrian traffic. Mm -hmm. That means standing on a sidewalk. Yeah. No, seriously. Because, you know, as corporations don't pay taxes, you take poor counties like St. Louis County, they depend on 30 or 40 percent of their revenues from fines. That was part of the impetus behind Ferguson. I, you know, I think of sort of the... the, the paradox of evil and sometimes I think of kind of the miracle of good. I mean, it's kind of miraculous that we figure out how to keep going anyway. And we do. And one of the places where our work intersects is for many years we were doing something called um, Youth Grow, a program with Albany County Department of Corrections where we had a deal essentially that, that young people could, if they were convicted of minor crimes, you know, could come to our farm, do a 50-hour leadership program, and then be absolved. You know, their record would be wiped clean. And when we talked to these young people who would come out to the farm, by and large, you know, they were in for non-crimes, truancy sort of getting out of control. But what was really powerful, you know, not to be trite about it, we're on a farm, and of course the first thought is slavery and all this stuff. But for young folks who are told that the only future for them is incarceration or early death or corporate conformity, they look around and they're like, Y'all seem really cool. You own this land. You built your house. These are your kids, and they're happy, and, 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 and you're sort of in charge of your own destiny. And these windows start opening up in terms of what is possible for my future. We had this one amazing young man, uh, Dijor Carter, who came very, very skeptical. He's like, this is better than jail, but not much, right? <laughs> and uh, he did not want to get out of the van. But then when we all started going on a tour, he was afraid that a bear would eat him. So he got out of the van. He didn't want to be left alone in the woods, you know? And uh, it's muddy. It's muddy on the land. Didn't want to ruin his sneakers. And so I said, well, you can ruin your sneakers or you can take them off. So he took off his shoes. All these young men take off their shoes. They're squealing. There's worms. There's bugs. You know. By the end of the tour, where they weren't listening to anything, we sat down. He said, you know, miss, this sounds really strange. But when I touch my barefoot on the earth, a memory of my grandmother came up through my foot and, and came to my heart. And when I was really little before she passed away, you know, she used to garden with me and she put insects in my hand. And Miss, I didn't think I had anything to do with this place, or this place had anything to do with me, but it does. It really does have something to do with me. And it's moments like those, they're not very quantifiable, but it's, it's a window into a different possibility, a different picture That's of That's right, and because it's, it's about um, transcendence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do come out of a religious tradition. I come out of Calvin. I have a very dark view of human nature. Um, and people ask about hope, and hope is... It's not, it's bound in the experience of that moment that you just described, but it, it's, it's bound in not, in, in the ineffable, in what is not necessarily practical. Um, so one of my students, one of my best students, went into prison at 14, tried as an adult for crime, I'm 100% certain he did not commit. He's not eligible to go before a parole board until he is 70 years old, he's mm. now 39. Mm. And my last class, he waits till everyone leaves, the bell goes, you gotta move quick or you get a charge. He waits behind, he was my only A-plus in the class, and he said, I know I'm going to die in this prison, but I work as hard as I do, because one day I'm going to be a teacher like you, and he walks out. That's what keeps me going. Um, you know, and maybe in some ways we only change the world one person at a time. You know, for me it's about the struggle, and I think we look back on African American history and the long struggle and the current struggle um, the utter failure, and Baldwin wrote about this endlessly, on the part of white America to acknowledge their crimes and, and give African Americans the reparations that um, is long overdue. I, I, you know, when you read the great, like Richard Wright and the great writers, and Baldwin, I mean, Richard Wright at one point, you know, he said the songs, our work chants, our spirituals, that's what we had in place of freedom. And in fact, I think it's a much more sophisticated understanding of the nature of evil and the capacity for resistance and the building of community. Which is why you spent a lot of time singing. 
there's a lot of singing and joy and dancing on the farm. There is, because there's a lot of trauma that we have generally, but particularly related to the lands. You know, we certainly have thousands of years of noble, proud, dignified history on the land as African heritage people. We came up with a lot of crops, a lot of techniques, you know, and then post-slavery, the land became the scene of the crime, as Chris Boldenusen would say. And so there is not a black person who comes to the farm whose first association is not enslavement or sharecropping. I don't stoop, I don't get dirty, I don't touch bugs. We left that behind in the red clays of Georgia when we went for the Great Migration. You know? And so part of what we realized we need to do, because I do believe the land is a source of healing as well as a source of material sustenance, is to directly address that trauma. And we use our Afro-Indigenous technologies to do that. And those are our songs, our music, our spiritual baths, our traditional religions. So our programs look like you know, a soil class on cation, cation exchange capacity and how to interpret a soil test and your right cover crops for the season. And then we're going to head over to the pond and we're going to do ceremony. We're going to call our ancestors. We're going to ask for healing and offer healing to them. Um, and it's been really profound. It, I, I didn't think there would be this overwhelming interest but we have a wait list two years long for these programs. Like our people are just clamoring to return to who we're meant to be. That's what, uh, that's what August Wilson captured in Joe Turner Come and Gone. You know, and he, he said, I mean, the play, which is set in Pittsburgh, 1910, but he talks about finding your song. Yeah. That's what Byron Walker tells them. And you he talks must about find your song. We are a land based agrarian yeah. people, and when we left Georgia, we left a piece of yeah. our souls behind. Yeah. He talks about that. There's two questions, and I have like two minutes left. One has to do with, is there a role for government in all of this? Because I think a lot of what we discover, what we, what we talk about in terms of healing feels very individual to me. And while that's important, we have bigger structures that help us shift power. But the second part is, how do we address the zero-sum thinking that has been so embedded in American and in Western capitalist cultures, that if you get yours, I'll lose mine? And that is clearly what is fueling a lot of people to support the maniacs of, of the Trump administration and others. That sense of someone else's joy is, is my loss, is taking from me. Well, I think the, the, the Trump, you know, that 40% of largely white and particularly male America, they, you know, they've been dispossessed as all of the working class has been dispossessed. But as Baldwin pointed out uh, in one of his essays, African American men as a general rule don't tend to go through a midlife crisis because African Americans are much more cognizant of the fact that the system's rigged against them. White uh, men are far more susceptible to the myth. And uh, of course now that myth has collapsed completely. And so um, they, they stoke that sense of, of vengeance that scapegoating, you know, you are suffering because the other, I mean, the whole idea that undocumented workers are responsible for economic collapse is, of course, you know, inc insane. The idea of these people don't even earn minimum wage, 11 million, whatever they are, people didn't destroy the, the economy. So I, I think that it's, it, it's, it's, as Baldwin pointed out, it's more a sense that what they expected, what they thought was their right, especially as white men, was not given to them. And so they are reacting with this incohate, irrational, um, violent uh, behavior that replicates exactly what I saw in Yugoslavia, by the way, with the economic meltdown of Yugoslavia. So Can we I think, tell them to take off their shoes? I mean, what, what, how did we reconnect? No, I think that, that the only hope is to reintegrate to people in the society to rebuild the social bonds uh, that can mitigate this rage. In many ways, the rage is legitimate, but of course, the target isn't. Um, but in Yugoslavia, with the war that I covered, or going back to Weimar, I mean, they always will find that particular scapegoat, and traditionally, people of color, intellectuals, homosexuals, I mean, it's the, the list remains mm -hmm. the same. Um, and, and Jews, I mean, the, the Jew, is, Israel's Jewish support for Trump is insane because Jews are on the list. Well, it's certainly not individual or government. I do think yeah. that you know, individual transformation then cat catalyzes institutional and societal transformation. So we still need to deal with the fact that the labor laws in this country 
don't give fair treatment to agricultural workers or food workers. We need to deal with the fact that we have a very unjust just immigration policy, that, that land is almost entirely controlled by white folks in this country. So there's, there's a lot of policies that need to change, and we work very hard on those. You know, these youth that I was talking about that come to the farm, they didn't just take off their shoes and feel good. They wrote a list of demands that were then championed by a number of nonprofit organizations working on prison reform and criminal justice reform. So both things need to happen. Um, but I do believe, you know, I, I, I do want to change policy and force social justice, essentially. I don't think it's, we didn't want to wait till every plantation owner changed their mind about slavery. We wanted to go ahead and pass an amendment. But that long-term change does come down to individual relationships. Um, when we talk about zero sum, it makes me think of this one neighbor we have, Phil, who waves a Blue Lives Matter flag and a big Trump sign. And uh, I ran into him at the Grafton Peace Pagoda, which is where a Japanese Buddhist peace monk like leads these really radical marches and stuff. And he's fixing her driveway because we just had some flooding. And so it's really incongruous. And I ask him, Phil, what are you doing? He's like, oh, you know, neighbors help neighbors and so on. And, and, I, and he said, Did that climate change thing, that might be a thing. You know, I was always told it's not really a thing, but that might be a thing. We've had a lot of flooding. And I said, so tell me about your flag that you fly, the Blue Lives Matter flag. And he said, oh, my uncle's a cop. I said, you know that's an anti-Black Lives Matter? Oh, no, I didn't know that. You know, and so in this interaction, in this relationship with Phil, which is very humanized, you know, we hire him to fix our driveway too, um, there's a breaking down of those imaginary barriers between it has to be me winning or you winning and an understanding of where the other person is coming from. Well, let's leave this conversation there. I hope that we can bring you all back together sometime soon. And if you want to see the Youth Bill of Rights on the Land, it's in the book that Leah has authored, um, Farming While Black. We have an interview about that book on, in our archives, as we do about Chris's. So check it out. That's lauraflanders.org. Till the next time, thank you both. That was very fun. Appreciate it. I have a firm belief that if individuals actually knew what was going on, then they would move with a sense of urgency to do something about this problem, because it is, in fact, a problem. Hi, I'm Chris Hedges, and I taught a drama course in East Jersey State Prison a couple years ago. And during that course, uh, we read August Wilson, Amira Baraka, and I proposed that first week that my students write scenes from their life. And I remember that first week I came home with 28 scenes and it blew my mind. Um, I had five or six incredibly talented writers that became the engine for this remarkable play that we ended up finishing in December called Caged. When you ask how many have got out besides me, me. I'm the only one who's gotten out of prison. He said, well, I want to put together a play in this class. You have 28 people. He said, what I want to do is I want to take the strongest writers, I want to bring them together to work on it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it in half, and I'm going to have half of the class write from the inside and half of the class write from the outside. Let's try to act it out. Let's see what happens. You want to be the pop? Okay. Can you be a dope thing? That's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to come up with something, or I'm going to try. Um, that's what I hope. I don't have no choice. I don't have no choice? Yeah. Well, that's better. Uh, it's a play that speaks the truth about the horrors of mass incarceration and neo-slavery. It's a truth we don't hear very much, and it's a painful truth. I'm June Ballinger, and I'm the uh, artistic director of Passage Theater in Trenton, New Jersey, and we have taken on the responsibility of putting this play on the stage. This is what they wrote for the dedication of their play. We have been buried alive behind these walls for years, often decades. Most of the outside world has abandoned us, but a few friends and family have never forgotten that we are human beings and worthy of life. It is to them, our saints, that we dedicate this play. In my hands, I, I held their story. I held their song, as Byron Walker says in Joe Turner, Come and Gone. 
and they're in cages, and I wasn't. And when I walked out of that prison holding their song into that darkened parking lot, I knew that it was my task to make their song heard. Mass incarceration started when, in the 80s? 70s, 80s? Now we're just having the conversation. Hey, I'm Laura. Just quickly, we here at Grit TV are proud to bring you independently produced content every day. So 10 years on, we are still beaming a light on the people and solutions that we believe can help move us all forward. And we are trying to raise $40,000 for this viewer-supported program. Will you join and give and do your part? You're watching The Laura Flanders Show, the place where, as we say, the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. So don't take a back seat. Join us. And as always, stay kind. Stay curious and thanks.